So welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. This is our kickoff talk of the new term. And we're very happy to have a rising star with us, Benny Yoshida. Benny was a student at MIT with Eddie Farhi and Peter Shore, postdoc at Caltech with John Preskill, and now he's research professor at the Perimeter Institute. He's going to tell us today about holographic scattering from quantum error correction. So Benny, <laughs> share your screen and take over. All right. <clears throat> um, okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so I guess the audience is, I think, very diverse. So I will try to be more uh, pedagogical. So pedagogical, and uh, yeah, please feel free to ask any questions if you have during the talk. So this talk is based on a recent paper with Alex May, um, Jonathan Source. Well, let me give you some background. So um, ADS CFT correspondence uh, in a very, very rough uh, language. Uh, it essentially says that uh, whatever happening on the uh, bulk of the negatively covered space time, quantum theory of gravity, um, there is a corresponding um, quantum theory on the boundary. So in this example, there are qubits and the matters are interacting with each other on the bulk, but there is a holographic realization on the boundary that is purely quantum mechanical without any gravity. So that is kind of the uh, belief of the ADS CFD correspondence. Now, uh, but uh, in the past uh, past decades, um, we have seen that uh, um, space time in ADS uh, space actually sort of emerges from quantum entanglement. And uh, this, again, it's more like a slogan, but uh, this idea <coughs> can be sort of verified in many aspects. So for instance, famously, if you want to compute the entanglement entropy, on some boundary interval, all you need to do is to look for a minimal surface that covers this region. And as you may know, uh, it's usually shorter to go inside the bulk because of the uh, negative curvature or hyperbolic nature of the system. And uh, here um, I show the two intervals A and B, and then <clears throat> Um, these two intervals are actually entangled with each other when um, there's this uh, blue solid line is the minimal length. So when there is a minimal surface connecting two boundaries, then usually there is a huge amount of entanglement. So for this reason, uh, connectedness of the bulk space is actually very important when we want to understand the entanglement in the boundary. And uh, another important aspect uh, is that uh, uh, there is this uh, quantum error correction property of the ADS CFT correspondence. Very roughly speaking, the idea is we have matter on the bulk, which you may just view as a bunch of qubits interacting with each other for simplicity. But then these qubits has some realization on the boundary. And then the way this is realized is like a quantum error correcting code in a sense that uh, the information about qubit is not like locally encoded, but it's more like a non-locally hidden all over the system. And the way this uh, holographic encoding works is exactly like a quantum error correction. And uh, we have proposed a tensor network toy model, which does, uh, which reproduces the key properties of such uh, ADS CFT correspondence. Okay, so that's good. But uh, so far, all these studies are more like a static. But uh, in this talk, I would like to look at the more dynamical problem. And uh, I'm gonna focus on the following setup, uh, which I call holographic scattering. Sometimes it's called holographic task. But uh, the setup is very simple. Imagine that there are three particles or qubits or three people 
uh, setting on the boundary of the ADS. So this one, two, and three. Then they jump into the center of the uh, ADS space, and then they can meet together, right? And then maybe they can interact with each other. I mean, if there are three people, then they can chat with each other and then say hi to each other. And then later they can uh, go back to the boundaries. And uh, yeah, in principle, this seems possible. So uh, this means that given these three particles arranged in this way, input and output locations, we should be able to implement arbitrary unitary operator U123 on these three qubits. But then the question is, uh, how do we actually realize such unitary transformation on, in the language of the boundary quantum mechanics? Um, we believe that this should be possible because of the ADS-CFT correspondence, but uh, finding such unitary is actually a very difficult problem. And uh, to discuss that, I need to actually briefly review uh, important work by Alex May from uh, three years ago or four years ago. So I will start by doing that. Okay, but uh, uh, here what I want to argue is that uh, this scattering or interaction among particles in the ads cft correspondence should be emerging from quantum entanglement as well. Okay, so let me briefly review what uh, Alex May did in 2000. 19. So he has considered a two particle version of the scattering. So what he considered is like he arranged uh, two particles, C1 and C2, the boundary and the R1 and the R2 are the output locations. Then, so he arranged these particles in a way that it's kind of twisted, right? I mean, input and output locations are kind of, uh, yeah, twisted. And then now, now, by properly normalizing the uh, unit of time and so on, we can uh, just uh, make sure that the, um, yeah, the yeah, unit of the time normalized. And then it turns out that uh, in the bulk, uh, you can just send all the particles to the center of the bulk and then they can scatter. And then this process uh, takes uh, the time duration that is pi. Um, and uh, that's something you can compute. But uh, if you try to reproduce this physics on the boundary, then that's a problem. So here on the right-hand side, um, this is the boundary uh, sheet. So that's uh, two pi rotations, right? So zero to two pi, so theta and then t. Then c1, c2, r1, and r2 are indicated, right? Yeah. Then now we ask that the bulk says that uh, these two particles can interact with each other. So on the boundary, again, uh, they should be able to interact with each other. But then we immediately notice that uh, we don't have actually enough time to do that. Namely, if I bring these two particles, C1 and C2 together, then you can send these two particles to R1, of course. But you don't have enough time to send it to R2. So then you can try to find any kind of path or channel of scattering on the boundary. But uh, it turns out that uh, even though on the bulk direct scattering is possible, uh, on the boundary, there is not enough time to do the scattering. So this is the kind of the puzzle which was pointed out by Alex May in 2019. And uh, I, th I think this is a big problem because, um, yeah, it's an issue of causality. And then it appears that the causality does not allow two particles to interact with each other on the boundary, which is, yeah, it's a very important and uh, serious uh, issue. And then to make this argument more precise, you can, of course, think about the future and the past light cones. And uh, these shaded areas are essentially like, uh, so red shaded areas are regions where C1 and C2, these two particles can reach on the boundary. 
And then this blue shaded areas are passed over the output points. And then you can see that these two regions do not overlap with each other. So there is no boundary scattering possible in this picture. So then this would, naively, this would suggest that uh, it's actually interactions are prohibited from ADS CFT correspondence. But if that's the case, then ADS CFT correspondence is a bit, yeah, boring. So um, yeah, there should be a way to resolve this issue. And here I just drew the simplified problem by drawing the following causal diagram. Again, on the bulk, you can just bring two particles together and they implement any unitary. In this case, two qubit U12, and then rescatter them to R1 and R2. But on the boundary, there is no direct scattering. So yeah, these two lines, diagonal lines, do not actually in intersect with each other. Then in this causal diagram, how do we make two input uh, qubits interact with each other? And then the resolution of this puzzle is probably, uh, it's a uh, relies on the quantum entanglement. Um, the, so, so here, let's make the following observation. Here, I drew some diamond-like region, which I call W1, W2 wedges. So W1 is uh, constructed in a way that it is in the future of C1. So C1 can access W1 region. But then after reaching W1 region, uh, these signals can reach R1 and R2, both of them. And similarly, W2 is the region which C2 can reach and then, then scatter off to R1 and R2. Okay. So then, then W1 and W2 are like the kind of region C1 and C2 can utilize in order to potentially make them interact with each other. Now, then given these uh, uh, W1, W2 regions, we can always ask um, they are entangled with, it, with each other or not. Then it turns out in this arrangement of particles uh, by using the, this root kernel formula or this entanglement formula, it turns out that W1, W2 are indeed entangled with each other. Well, it's actually very entangled with each other in a sense that if we arrange C1, C2 and R1, R2 so that they can meet, then it seems that W1, W2 are entangled. But if we arrange them so that they cannot meet on the bulk, then W1, W2 seems like they are not entangled with each other in many cases. So this suggests that um, maybe this entanglement between W1, W2 is very crucial in order to make two input particles interact with each other. So with this picture in mind, uh, this observation in mind, let us draw this kind of a modified uh, causal diagram on the boundary. Again, on the bulk, it's very simple. It's just uh, direct scattering. But on the boundary, what we see is that C1 and C2 shares entanglement. Uh, that is uh, carried by uh, these two wedges, W1, W2. Then the idea is maybe we can somehow use this W1, W2 entanglement in order to implement this uh, two qubit unitary transformation and make these two particles interact with each other. Then now with this, these observations combined, actually, uh, some older results from quantum information theory already actually know the answer to this question. Um, um, so in short, uh, we know that uh, some class of a unitary transformation you want to can be implemented very efficiently. And uh, the, I think the, fam the most famous example of such an idea is uh, actually called the B84 protocol that was proposed as a kind of a idea of a quantum cryptography in 1984. 
And uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go into detail of this B84 protocol. It's a bit complicated, but uh, um, the upshot is that uh, there is some protocol which requires C1 and C2 to interact with each other. And then this task can be performed only when C1 and C2 shares um, entanglement. And the idea is actually very simple. Uh, you use the quantum teleportation and then you can send C1 teleport to C2 through the entanglement. So now you have C1 and C2, so you can make them interact with each other and then redistribute C1 and C2 to the output locations. But uh, yeah, but this uses a quantum teleportation. So there is a unwanted uh, power errors. So in order to correct that, yeah, you need uh, to do something beyond that. So in that sense, uh, this uh, type of the interactions are pretty limited. Anyhow, there is actually one protocol which is like almost 40 years old. Well, teleportation is more recent than V84, but yeah, such an idea exists. But uh, more recently, um, there's another important development for the port-based teleportation, which actually allows us to implement arbitrary unitary transformation you want to. Uh, by using uh, entanglement. But the problem of this uh, protocol is that uh, for n qubit system, if C1 is n qubit, C2 is n qubit, then you actually need exponentially many uh, EPR pairs uh, in order to implement the uh, arbitrary you want to. So it's not very efficient. So I believe at this moment, uh, we still don't know uh, how to do unitary in an efficient manner. But the point is that by using entanglement, uh, we can indeed make particles interact with each other. Now, OK, so now these are more like uh, developments from quantum information theory, but uh, there is another uh, nice development from uh, uh, well, gravity. And uh, uh, namely, uh, uh, yeah, so Alex May and the Pennington and the source in 2020, they have uh, proved a certain theorem, which they call connected wedge theorem, which in a very simplified, maybe less precise term, uh, what they show is that uh, when such two, such two particle scattering process is possible, then the corresponding wedges W1 and W2 are connected. So this suggests that the W1 and W2 are indeed entangled with each other. Then this proof, uh, their proof uses the so-called focusing conjecture, which is widely believed to be uh, true in the ADS-CFT correspondence. But uh, uh, looking back, uh, their proof was actually a bit limited. Um, the, so in a new work, which is with uh, uh, Alex May and uh, Jonathan Source, uh, we actually provided a little bit more uh, precise version of the proof. And also now our new result works for uh, three particles or more particles. But the point is that uh, you can prove the necessity of uh, entanglement, uh, both from the bulk quantum gravity viewpoint and also from the boundary uh, quantum information viewpoint. Okay, so hopefully I have convinced you that uh, uh, somehow this uh, like, it's just a negatively curved space time, you know, then when you go to some specific location in some specific time, you can say hi to other friends and so on, then interact with each other. But the, such interactions, if you try to understand it from the language of the asymptotic boundary quantum mechanics, then it turns out that uh, it's not simple at all, and that you need to utilize uh, quantum entanglement, which is nicely provided by the connected wedges. And the at least uh, quantum information theory in the past, it, it tells us how to do such interactions to some extent, but um, I believe that these 
protocols are not so natural and uh, it's a bit artificial. So that's uh, still an open problem. Now, yes, so as I mentioned that uh, these protocols based on teleportations and so on, a little bit artificial, I would say. I don't think like when we meet together in the ADS space, I don't think we are interacting through the uh, quantum teleportation. So uh, we want to make um, come up with more uh, natural uh, protocols to make particles interact with each other. So then uh, I would like to advocate that uh, holographic scattering should be emerging uh, from the nature of quantum interaction. Okay, for that, let me just briefly remind you of uh, the idea of uh, quantum error correction. Um, again, for simplicity, I'll uh, think about this uh, uh, two plus one dimensional bulk and one plus one dimensional boundary. Then uh, there is some known result in ADS CFT correspondence, which says uh, causal wedge reconstruction. Uh, what it says is that uh, we look at some bulk point which I indicated with phi. And that's an operator that's acting on that point on the bulk. And then this operator can be, of course, written as some boundary operator. But it turns out that if it's con contained in this uh, minimal surface, then you can always write it down as um, some operator on the boundary, like in this interval A. So it's a kind of a localized operator on this interval. So that is called a causal wedge reconstruction. Now, the idea of quantum error correction uh, emerges from the following observation. We will look at the operator phi sitting at the center of the bulk. Then we notice that this phi is contained in the causal wedge of interval AB, interval BC, interval AC, right? So this means that the phi operator can be written as an operator OAB, OBC, OCA. So three different uh, operators. Now, this fact that the bulk operator phi can correspond to various different but equivalent operators is actually a nature of a quantum error correction, meaning that even though OAB, OBC, OCA are different operators, but they act in the same way in the uh, subspace, not the entire. So they are different operator, of course, in the whole Hilbert space. But if you restrict your attention to subspace over the Hilbert space, then these three operators have the same action. And uh, this subspace is usually called a uh, uh, code word subspace or quantum code subspace. So for this reason, it seems that from this uh, very simple observation based on causal wedge reconstruction, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the way uh, bulk physics is realized on the boundary holographically, this realizes the uh, kind of nature of uh, quantum error correction. And then, um, well, to, to make this observation more um, clear, um, you can imagine that uh, A and B and C are qubits, right? Then suppose that you lost all the qubits on C, then you only have access to A and B, but still you can reconstruct the information about the phi, the, this bulk information. Meaning that, so losing one subsystem is fine in this case. So this encoding uh, is protected from the erasure error of qubits. So this is the way to see the quantum error correction nature of uh, ads CFT correspondence. Okay, now, um, now, so in analogy with this uh, Alex May's observation, we can actually, uh, easily argue that the quantum error correction nature of the ADS correspond ADS CFT correspondence already, already <clears throat> requires quantum entanglement. 
indeed, um, we can easily show that uh, there is actually not enough time to delocalize quantum information over the whole system um, in a simple uh, boundary picture. Because by the time uh, the particle reaches to the center of the bulk, this information should be you now completely delocalized over the whole quantum system on the boundary. But if you look at the boundary causal uh, structure, then you notice that uh, uh, the bulk, the input signal can cover only half of the entire system. So unless we utilize quantum entanglement in some clever manner, we cannot uh, achieve such a quantum error correcting code like encoding. Now, in order to demonstrate why this quantum error correction idea can be a key to resolve this issue about holographic scattering, uh, we, it is actually uh, useful, to, useful to think about three particle scattering procedures. Uh, so for this, uh, we arrange three qubits, one, two, and three, like shown in this uh, left-hand side figure. And then when they meet together, they interact with each other. So this time, it's arbitrary three qubit unitary transformation, U1, two, three. Then, yeah, so they can do the direct scattering. So we naturally expect that uh, on the boundary in the quantum mechanics, we should be able to do the same thing. So on the right hand side, I do uh, the causal structure of the uh, input and the output point. It's uh, located like equally. Then you can actually easily see that this time, two in, two out scattering path is allowed. So for instance, you can bring C2 and C3 together and then scatter them to R2 and R3. So you can implement two qubit unitary in this geometry, but three in, three out direct scattering is not possible again in this setup. Now with this observation in mind, actually I can always like draw some uh, nice uh, simplified uh, boundary causal uh, graph. So on the right hand side. Uh, so the point is that there is actually an intermediate points, which I call M1, M2, M3. And these points, are, points represent uh, this two in, two out scattering process. That is uh, two particles can come together and they scatter off to the output locations. So this right-hand side figure basically summarizes the all the uh, causal, stru causal uh, structure of the, uh, this bulk physics seen from the boundary viewpoint. Then we sort of already learned from the causal wedge reconstruction or quantum error corrections and so on that uh, when particles are sent to the center of the bulk, it's really encoded non-locally over all the uh, degree of freedom on the boundary. So then, then we see that these interactions are applied, U1, 2, 3 are applied when these three particles are encoded. So this sort of uh, motivates us to think about the following scenario. First, uh, you have input qubits, C1, C2, C3. These are just, yeah, just wave function, just simple qubits. But then when we send them to the center of the bulk, um, the C1, C2, C3 will be encoded into some subspace of a quantum error correcting code. Then when they reach these intermediate regions, M1, M2, M3, um, they will be completely encoded into some quantum code. And then this is where the interaction should happen. And then they may interact with each other in some way. And then later they scatter and then re-emerges, you know, emerges as an output information, R1 and R2 and R3. So this is like uh, the physical picture we, would, we should have uh, in order to understand this uh, scattering process. Okay, now 
Okay, so this is like a blueprint for three particle scattering procedure. But as I mentioned that um, direct scattering is not possible. So we should be relying on the quantum entanglement. So the next task is, of course, to look at what kind of quantum entanglement is available to C1 and C2 and C3. And then this time, we can draw uh, these three wedges, W1, W2, W3. These are like a past of the old output points, but the future of one of the input locations. And then the question is, C1, C2, C3 are entangled or not? And then. We can easily show that, well, with our improved or generalized uh, connected wedge theorem, this W and W2, W3 are uh, indeed entangled with, uh, with each other in some way. Okay. So that's a good news. So we should try to use these entanglements. But there is actually a problem. Um, it turns out that in this particular geometry we considered, uh, these W1, W2, W3 are somehow entangled with each other. But if you look at any two subsystem, let's say W and W2, W2, W3, and so on, then they do not share any bipartite entanglement, meaning that their entanglement is more of a multipartite nature. So W1 is entangled with joint of W2 and W3, but it's not, it's, it's, it's basically multipartite entanglement. So it's, there is no EPR pair you can utilize in this setting. And this is a big problem because all the previous protocols like BAT4 or quantum teleportation or port-based teleportations and so on, these, these essentially rely on teleportation. But teleportation requires uh, EPR pairs, right? But in this case, we don't have EPR pairs. So yeah, so these teleportation-based protocols do not work. But uh, we have resolved this issue in a very nice trick we came up with that is instead of considering entanglement between W1, W2, and so on, we actually consider the entanglement between W1 and M3 region. Because remember that M3 is a future of W2 and W3. So we should be in principle send some of the degree of freedom from W2 and W3 to M3 locations. Then we can have EPR pair because W1 is now entangled with W2 and W3. So then by utilizing this EPR pair between different time slices, um, it turns out that uh, we can achieve uh, encoding into a quantum error correcting code. So now by looking at this uh, causal structure, of course, C1 can send a signal to M1 and M2 because these lines are connected. But now by making interactions, you know, imposing some interaction between C1 and the part of the EPR pair, it's actually C1's information can be sort of evenly distributed over M1, M2, M3 kind of non-local. So by utilizing this uh, quantum entanglement, uh, yeah, you can achieve a nice uh, encoding into quantum error correcting code. And this kind of idea is actually called uh, entanglement assisted quantum error correction in QI literature. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, entanglement assisted. And um, the whole point is that uh, we make input and part of the EPR pair interact with each other. Then you, you don't need to touch M3 degree of freedom at all in order to achieve this non-local encoding. Now, uh, for people who are familiar with um, some of the developments on the scrambling or back hole information loss problem and so on, you may find that uh, this mechanism is actually same as the sort of the uh, Hayden Presque recovery program, where uh, you send the information into the black hole, but uh, this black hole is entangled with the uh, early radiation degree of freedom. So then 
with this analogy, C1 and M3 are like an entangled black hole. Then M3 is like the early radiation. And then it's essentially the same uh, mechanism that uh, why this information can be non-locally encoded over M1, M2, M3. Yeah, so I expect that there should be some um, relation, but uh, you know, I don't have any concrete thing to say, but uh, there it's, it's essentially the, the same me mechanism. Now, once it's encoded, uh, what we should do is um, we should encode it and then implement interactions and then later we decode it. But the nice uh, clever thing about this protocol is that uh, decoding is possible even if you have only access to only two subsystems, right? So in this picture, in this uh, green, uh, you can reconstruct the information without ever touching M3. Just having access to M1 and M2 is enough. So yeah, in this way, um, a, a, a scattering is possible. Now, the final task is to come up with how to make these particles interact with each other. And then that is about the interaction in the quantum error correcting code. So in the language of quantum error correcting code, what we have done is that we have prepared three input information on C1, C2, C3, and then we encoded it into uh, some code word of uh, quantum error correcting code that is now distributed over M2, M M1, M2, and M3. Then in order to make them interact with each other, we need to apply the so-called logical operators. And uh, logical operators are operators, with unitary operators, which you implement in order to change the encoded qubits, logical qubits. But changing the encoded information is essentially making them interact with each other in the uh, code word subspace of a quantum error correcting code. So what we should do is to implement logical operators. But there's one problem that is uh, Psi1, Psi2, Psi3 are encoded into quantum error correcting code now, again, distributed over M1, M2, M3, that's good. But M1, M2, M3 are spatially disconnected regions, meaning that, uh, well, this means that uh, the operation you can do should have a factorizable form, V1 times V2 times V3, because yeah, M1 and M2 are causally disconnected. So you shouldn't be able to implement uh, non-factorizable unitary. So we are forced to apply these interactions by using transversal factorized logical operators only. So as an example, I wrote down some interaction on the right-hand side, but this is an example which cannot be implemented because you cannot rewrite it into this factorized form. So the type of the interaction we can implement is still quite limited. And then now, uh, okay, now, if you are familiar with the developments of the hot torrent quantum computing, uh, this transversal logical operator is a very big, uh, famous program, uh, almost like since the beginning of uh, quantum information theory. I mean, in a sense that like after the invention of quantum error correcting code, people immediately noticed that uh, this transversal logical operators are a very important object to study. And then there are various results known about uh, what kind of transversal logical operators can be implemented and so on. But uh, so far, what we were able to do is that uh, we can show that uh, arbitrary Clifford logical gauge can be applied uh, in our case. And then for this protocol, we only need a uh, linear number of uh, linear amount of uh, EPR pairs. So what we can show now is that uh, three qubit or three spins can be in, can be they, they can interact with each other uh, in a very efficient manner and um, through uh, arbitrary Clifford gate. 
And also we show that uh, some of the uh, phase gate can be implemented uh, very uh, efficiently. But we, we, we haven't been able to come up with a uh, protocol that works for arbitrary uh, quantum gate at this moment. Then again, I want to mention that uh, this transversal logical gate is a very important subject to study. Uh, in quantum information theory, uh, we know that uh, a set of uh, transversally implementable logical gates must form a discrete group. So not all U123 are transversally implementable. Um, this is a very known result, a famous result due to Easting and New. But uh, this is a result for uh, exact quantum error correcting code. But got, by going to the approximate quantum error correcting code, we may be ab able to avoid this uh, normal theorem. And uh, it, this may suggest that the uh, ADS-CFT correspondence may be avoiding this Easton new theorem in a very clever way by going to the approximate quantum error correction. Okay, um, so I guess I would like to summarize my talk. Um, so we have started from this simple observation that, uh, uh, so again, ADS CFT correspondence says that whatever happening on the bulk of the negatively curved space time, it has a holographic realization. Oh, it's a quantum mechanics with a relativistic quantum mechanics on the boundary. And, uh, but building on this belief of the ads CFT correspondence, we have looked at this very simple process that is uh, some particles come together and they interact with each other in the bulk of the ads space time. But then this process, if you try to understand it from the boundary, naively, this looks like an impossible task uh, because causal structure of the boundary does not seem to allow it. But the key to resolve this issue seems to be that uh, uh, on the boundary, there is actually hidden quantum entanglement, which is related to the uh, connectedness of the space time on the bulk. And then the idea is by utilizing this entanglement in a clever manner, we might be able to induce nice interactions among particles in the center of the ADS space. And uh, for two in two particle cases, there are some, there have been some developments, but uh, um, the proposed quantum information theoretic protocols have been a bit artificial, like just the teleportations and so on. And then uh, in this work, we have, I believe we, we, we hopefully we made this picture more, a little bit more physically natural by using quantum error corrections. And uh, the reason why I believe that this is more physical is that the quantum error correction is uh, one of the key defining property of the uh, ADS CFT correspondence, the holographic encoding. Then it seems that the interaction in the bulk ADS spacetime seems to be emerging from logical operations in this quantum error correcting code. And again, I want to emphasize that uh, this encoding is possible because of the pre-existing entanglement among these wedges. And especially what we use is uh, entanglement assisted quantum error correction, which also appeared in, the, in studies of a, a scrambling and the hidden press scale problem for black hole information recovery. Now, we have shown that some type of interaction can be implemented, but uh, we still do not know if arbitrary gate can be implemented or not. And uh, so then, but uh, it's probably nice to find, uh, point out some analogy with uh, photon and quantum computing. So here, what we do is we send signals to the center of the bulk and then do some interaction and then yeah read it out on the boundary. But this is actually very similar to how we perform uh, quantum computing. In quantum computing, what we do is first we prepare input states 
then we encode it into a quantum error correcting code and uh, we induce inter interaction among them. That is how you do the quantum computation. And then later you decode the outcome of the quantum computation by decoding. So in, in some sense, in it's, this procedure is very similar. That is uh, how the holographic scattering happens is more or less like how we would imagine we would do a uh, full torrent uh, quantum computer computing. Um, but uh, but these are more like a, a bit uh, of a uh, yeah um, like just an analogy. But uh, as a more concrete uh, future problem, uh, I say that the. Uh, um, in ADS space uh, on the bulk, uh, we often consider uh, some Lagrangian for the matter field, but then we, we normally stop with the uh, second order term, but uh, we, we, we are of course uh, allowed to add more like interaction terms. And then the, I think the key question is how does this, this higher order terms affect this boundary Lagrangian? Because these are the interaction terms which should be emerging somehow on the boundary. And then this boundary Lagrangian, maybe we can just write it down nicely, but uh, this boundary Lagrangian should be, I mean, this boundary interaction should be induced interaction should be uh, somehow utilizing uh, this entanglement. And uh, I want to understand how. And uh, another question is maybe complexity of unitary is something important to talk about because some of the complicated unitary transformation on n qubits uh, just it takes time to implement it, right? So then, even if they meet on the bulk, maybe they don't have enough time to implement such complicated unitary transformations. So in that sense, maybe it's natural to think that uh, you cannot uh, implement arbitrary uh, unitary transformation in an efficient manner. Then um, finally, uh, we now know we have some hints to understand how to write down interaction term u123 on the bulk sitting at the center of the system. And then this is probably giving us a very useful hint to finally write down this bulk operator u123 in the language of the boundary uh, uh, degrees of freedom. That, that will be an interesting uh, open problem. Okay, so that's all. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benny, for a really interesting and insightful talk. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. So for the moment, I'll unshare your screen and uh, look at the gallery. So. As we ask questions, I hope that you'll turn on your video so we can interact and uh, go ahead. Is there somebody who'd like to ask the first question or make a comment? Hi, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, uh, I just uh, see that this construction is somehow we really like the written diagram in ADS safety. Uh, and I have a question is like, because in ADS safety, the propagators of the boundary are all inside the bulk, they have some relations. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you can you can do some extra extrapolation and then to get a boundary uh, propagator. So uh, did you like try to understand what will happen in the boundary if you have some propagator of the boundary and then to like, then going to the bulk to see what's the relation between those uh, propagators. Right, right, right. So, so for on on the bulk, uh, the calculation is very it's, it's simple because let's say I add like a third order term and uh, we can just do the calculation to talk about two particle scattering. So, on the bulk side, the calculation is easy, <clears throat> but on the boundary side. Uh, this 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 seems to be very complicated in a sense that uh, um, 
if all these uh, observations are valid, then it means that uh, on the boundary, somehow uh, CFT should be utilizing entanglement. But uh, on the CFT, I will insert uh, perturbations or, or like these qubits by adding uh, uh, light perturbations, like light operators. But then somehow I feel that uh, this uh, connectedness of the wedges and so on are intrinsically related to heavy operators. Uh, that's uh, just my feeling. And then so then I probably need to think about uh, like uh, coupling with heavy operators and, and so on. Then by looking at this causal structure on the boundary, then then yeah, it looks a bit complicated and. Uh, yeah, so, but, so at, at this moment, I do not know how to handle this calculation, but uh, may, maybe for experts, it might be uh, doable calculations. But uh, yeah, I do believe that uh, matching these result in a convincing way. And then if it's done nicely, then it should be able to tell us the importance of the entanglement uh, more uh, in a transparent manner. So yeah, this is exactly, is I think it's a very important problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. So, Benny, do you have any results for more than three particles? More than three particles, right? Um, yes. So, <laughs> I. I've tried, of course, a uh, few cases like four particles, five particles, and six particles, and so on. And, uh, yes, yeah, so, so um, what I can see is that it seems that, uh, yes, the geometry is giving us uh, enough uh, entanglement to, to achieve nice. Uh, quantum error correcting code and uh, right. But um, yeah, so that, 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 that is my observation I have, but uh, I do not have any uh, generic uh, result to, to generic or more precise or rigorous result at this moment. Yeah. And uh, I have another question. Uh, can you formulate some of your results as precise mathematical theorem? Uh, to some extent. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So what are our results? Um, so our result is like like it's a we we te technically we have three type of results. First is about uh, proof from the gravity. That part is pretty rigorous and. Uh, and uh, so then, so in a sense that uh, by using uh, essentially a classical gravity result, we prove that uh, this wedge needs to be connected. Uh, that part uh, is pretty rigorous. And uh, under the precisely stated uh, assumptions. Now, another result, which is also, I think, rigorous, is that uh, we can show that if particles can interact with each other on the bulk, then the initial like particles on the boundary, they need to share some non-trivial entanglement. That can be rigorously proven uh, also by uh, quantum information theoretic protocol in a sense that uh, a proof that uh, in a sense that uh, we can give some uh, interaction interaction unitary what interaction task that can be achieved only when the input systems share entanglement now the thing i talked about mainly in this talk is about one potential protocol for quantum error correcting code uh, th this is just a protocol in a sense that it works and uh, um, it, it's one example of such a protocol. So um, yeah, so it, it works, but uh, I cannot 
yeah, it, it works in a way that it works, but um, yeah, I cannot, I don't know if I can turn it into a theorem uh, or something. Great. This is one example of the protocol. So are there are other comments or questions. Are there any other comments? If if so, please unmute yourself and talk. Otherwise, I'd like to thank, yes? Well, I'd like to thank then Benny again for a very interesting talk. And I hope you add in your slide the reference to your recent papers. And uh, yes. we'll look forward very much to how this program progresses. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Yeah, and we'll continue next week. Next week's talk is by Dan Freed, and we have a very good lineup for the rest of the term. Thank you and bye. Bye-bye. See you next week. <laughs>